2000 that I first got my exposure to these things, and it was, well, uh, in 2001 the term Agile was coined, and I've been using them since, the, since they were a thing, and I want to tell you it's gone horribly sideways. Uh, people don't use them quite right. So I want to bust down to some basics, and as, as always, if you've seen me present before, I've got too much to present, so I'll edit a little bit on the fly, because I'd very much like you guys to get, the, get some practice creating a story map. So I'm going to uh, uh, favor doing versus, uh, versus just talking. Now, a few people have asked me, I've got a workshop running on, on Friday and Saturday, and if you're in that workshop, yes, everything I say here, I will repeat Thursday and Friday. So I've told a couple people, I don't come to this because if you're in that workshop, you're going to get it already. I'm going to do this in a little bit of a weird style because I want to control my deck and there may be times I want to draw a picture here. So I've got this desktop thing to do that. So let's break this down. We've got three parts to this. I want to talk about what stories are and aren't and why they're such a simple thing and why such a simple thing can be so complicated. I want to talk about what a story map is because well, that's the way I like to work with stories and I think we might be blending a little bit of two and three because maybe the best way to learn about a story map is for you guys to create one and we'll have to go through the process to create it. So let's start from the beginning here. Uh, did anybody read that Dilbert cartoon? Well, I didn't have a slide up so you could read it. But the, if you look at the URL on that, the date is 2003, I believe January of 2003, which means the, the authors or Scott Adams, Scott Adams? Okay, yeah, I get my Hitchhiker's Guide Adams and, and <laughs> this Adams, sometimes I transpose those. Uh, it means it, you know, he knew in 2002 what these things were. The, the story thing is not a new idea. It's a fairly old idea. And the, the, the story thing came from this guy, Kent Beck. Uh, Kent, in the late uh, 90s, was looking at, at process and was looking for things that were going wrong. So if you treated the process that you work with like a product, the thing that you're making, and you want your process to work better, you, you look for problems or things you can fix. And one of the things he latched on to is the way we uh, transfer information to each other, the, the, the way we write things down as requirements and hand them over to each other. Now, there are a number of problems with that, but one of the bigger problems is, it, well, it just doesn't work. I have to show you some examples of how written instructions don't work. These are silly and they may not completely translate well. Uh, these are examples, well, there's a blog out there, and if you want to waste a lot of your time, go visit a, a blog called Cake Rex. And there's a lot of, it's, it's silly, there's a lot of oddly decorated cakes, but one of the underlying themes is misinterpreted instructions. Now, if you, I see a few of you smiling, so you can tell, can you tell how those instructions were misinterpreted? Uh, obviously, underneath was misspelled wrong, but well, they've just <laughs> written exactly what was there. You know, sometimes people just don't pay attention and, uh, and just really aren't following the instructions. This one's a little bit tougher to detect. Can, you, can anybody see the problem there or where the decorator went wrong? Anybody got it? Yeah, the, Stuff on the right side is telling you how the left side should have been done. Now, you might think we could solve this problem by uh, doing documents electronically, perhaps it's handwriting and other things, and more specifications. So we might put those documents on a USB drive and hand those to the cake decorator, who will then go to work decorating the cake. Uh, this is a cake decorator that didn't look at the document, but duplicated the USB drive on the cake. <laughs> Uh, there's just straight up you know, reading the words and not paying attention. There's the misinterpretation of non-functional requirements. I don't know if that's going to kill me if I have a nuts allergy or not. And then just not paying attention. Now, these are funny. Uh, 
but uh, uh, this is a fairly old story. I just isn't uh, India working on sending out an orbiter in Mars, uh, and that's trying to go on right now. Is that correct? So uh, there's a lesson to be learned here. This is when the, the United States did it, and the, the United States created a Mars orbiter, and for I don't know what the to look up exactly how many millions of dollars were spent on this thing. Uh, the, the thing headed off to Mars, and just when it came time to, to enter and, and start orbiting Mars, and instead it crashed directly into Mars. There was some, apparently some software written by ground crews, and, and one group of people writing software were using uh, the metric system, and another group of people were using the imperial system, and it had been well documented, but, uh, well, Somewhere it got lost in translation, and uh, it, that kind of mistake cost a lot. So that's not so funny. Now, Kent's idea w was simple. Now, one of the things that's happened is the, the original idea has sort of gotten lost in translation over the last decade. So I had to have a little bit of a conversation with Kent back and forth. And, and just pulling this out of my email, I said, Kent, where did you get this idea? And uh, he said, you know, what I was thinking of was the way users can sometimes tell stories about the cool new things that their software does. For instance, I type in the zip code and it automatically fills in the city and state without me having to touch a button. I think that was the example that triggered the idea. If you can tell stories about what the software does and generate energy and interest and vision in your listener's mind, then why not tell stories? Stories are called stories because they're meant to be told. If I had a, uh, I'm tired of the question, how do I write good stories? Uh, be, because the point is, the reason they're named this is they're supposed to be told. And it's, it's not a way to write better requirements. Uh, because the, the, the fundamental principle here is that the way we write them doesn't work. So the idea was simple. Uh, First off, I've got to organize a lot of things that I want, and I, I need to basically just write what I want on a card. Doesn't matter what you write on a card, just write some stuff on a card. And then I get together with somebody who can build something, and we have a conversation. It's through that conversation that we tell our story, that the person building understands who's using it and what they're doing and what's expected to see, and, and together they kind of work out what should be built, and the developer starts to work out what how they can build it. Now, there's a, I should have done a, a show of hands here. How many people in the room work with user stories right now today? That's a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back to basics here, too remedial, I'm sure. Uh, you've all heard this card conversation confirmation. Some of you have heard that mantra. Oh, first off, that's, let me, I'm going to hit it again uh, because well, it goes like this. You, you write a card and you have this conversation. Now the person coming into the conversation has an idea of what they want, and because it's a conversation, they explain it to the other person, who then listens closely and forms an idea in their head of what that person wants. Now it's a conversation, so that person can then ask questions, and they realize uh, the idea I've got and what you said isn't right, and they start having a conversation, and through that conversation, they arrive at some shared understanding of what they want. Now, if you're watching the slides closely, you'll notice that the shared understanding that happens in that conversation isn't the same thing as the person who wrote the card came in with. If your goal is to write perfect stories that have all the details in them and get it right, then you're not using stories right. The goal is for us to get together and actually learn something, and it's that collaboration between the builder, the, the maker, and, the, and the, the one who needs something that, that has the real power. This is not another way to specify things. Now, uh, agile processes take a big hit for we don't write down anything. Now, the truth is you write down in buckets. Anybody using agile development knows that you write down a ton. But what's, and you might come into this conversation with a ton written down already, but you use this to point and discuss and change. And I work with UI designers who will come in with the UI, but you have to sort of expect it to get marked up and changed and, and well, expect change. But at the end, we're driving to the answer to the question, how will, what exactly are we going to build? And how will I confirm that we've done it? 
So that's that confirmation part. It, it's an agreement between us that we, okay, we're on the same page, and this is how I'm going to check to see if it's done. Now, the, the, over time, uh, we've evolved the best way of doing that is writing uh, acceptance tests or acceptance criteria or story tests. And, well, the answer to the question, what will I check to confirm this is done? Now, I believe that there's not three C's, there's five C's. Uh, uh, the, the next one is actually constructing or building this thing. And then after that, well, we've got to you know, show the story at that sprint review thing. But the truth is, the blue guy did not build it for the green guy. They built it for these other people. And these other people have to look at it. And we have lots and lots of conversations. And here's where it gets really ugly. We usually find out it wasn't the right thing. And how we then change it is by writing a card. And it's a cycle. Um, my friend Alistair Coburn said, uh, for every story you put in the backlog, or for everything you need, you should put three in the backlog. I said, well, what do you mean, Alistair? He said, well, just write the thing you need on a card and then put in two more. I said, well, what do I write on the second ones? And this is the other two cards. Alistair said, it doesn't matter. And I said, I can't just write nothing on them. And he said, well, if you have to write something, on the first card, put what you want. On the second card, put fix the first card. And on the third card, put fix the second card. If you're not going around this cycle a few times, you're not learning. and well, you don't get it right the first time. That's not the goal. So you don't get it right going into the conversation, and even when you agree, you don't get it right afterwards. Those are hard pills to swallow. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, they're, they're a bit true. The point is that well, this is about conversation. And well, the, the idea is fairly simple. But simple doesn't mean easy. Let's, I've got to go back to this. Uh, the idea is simple, but there's, well, you can already smell and you already experience tons of things that go wrong. Um, basically, people don't have conversations about the right things. Now, I'm going to spin quickly through a model I used yesterday, and this is the model that frames my thinking always. Uh, when I'm building software, I'm building software not to build something, but to, to create a benefit. And I draw this now and later model a lot. See how fast I can spin through it here. Uh, the we start with thinking about the world now, and we see people in the world that are unhappy, that are uh, confused or frustrated, and we get ideas about what to build. Now, I might call those, those could be products or features or enhancements to features we've got. We might eventually start, call, you know, specify them and call them specifications, and at some point in time, we'll call them our requirements. Now, remember that requirements are just what we call our great ideas to solve people's problems. Now, we go through some development process, agile or not. And at the end, we end up with a delivery. And what we hope is true later is that those people that we identified with problems are now happy. They're not happy because, because we delivered this stuff. They're happy because they start using it and their life gets better. And not everyone's as happy. And some people you just can't please. Now. Everything between that idea and that delivery, that's output. That's the junk we measure with velocity. That's the stuff we put in burn down charts. And it's just stuff. But what we want is what happens afterwards. What we, what we want are outcomes. And those outcomes are measured by how people behave differently as a consequence of using that software. How do they work differently? How is it better than they used to work? Are they happier? And well, what changes? Now, some changes, if I deliver a piece of software, I can right away start to observe people and measure outcomes. If I'm delivering some e-commerce e sort of software and I make some changes and I observe that more people look at more products and they buy more, I can observe that right away. But if my goals were bigger, I'm trying to change my position in the marketplace or improve customer satisfaction, I don't measure that the day after I deliver something. I, that takes longer. And the word I'll use for that is, is impact. Your job in software development is not to deliver more software. Your job is to deliver less software. Your job is to minimize that output and maximize outcome. I want to pound that in here. Output is what we build. Outcome is what we actually want. 
And the stories we write are about the future. They're about outcome. And well, what went wrong with stories is people started going into these conversations and they started well, delivering specifications. They started describing what to build. And the, and the listener to that conversation, all they can do is take a lot of notes and ask questions about what to build. And well, they can't offer any better ideas or better solutions. So uh, well, somebody came up with the clever idea that, look, we need to get people talking about the right thing, so let's get them to talk about who, what, and why. So the template, as a type of, as a kind of person, a user, I want some something, so that I can turn that frown upside down, so that I can uh, get some benefit. That template is made to build, well, is made to help us have the right conversation. Now. Uh, People make the mistake of thinking that that template is the story. It's not the story. In fact, one of the important things about a story is that it have a crisp, sharp title, one that I can refer to in conversation, one that I can point to and say, I'm working on that such and so story. Do not fill your backlog full of these as I want to so that statements because, well, you know what happens. At a stand-up meeting, everybody will start to refer start to refer to story number 128, uh, and that's no longer communicating it, anything at all. No one knows what we're talking about, and give it a short title, and you might use that template to, to help drive the right conversation. Now, well, it, it's it, there's the the problem with people not uh, talking about the right things, but there's problems with people not talking at all. What goes wrong with that template is people think, okay, I just have to write them in that template and then I am done. That's it. I can hand those off the same way I used to handle handoff requirements. Let's see if I've got these slides in the right order. Now, I, I love and hate that template. I see uh, Dave standing in the back of the room or sitting back there and I uh, saw him speak earlier last night and I think you might share my opinion on this. Uh, now, I want to make a quick point about the way we learn to do things isn't the way we, the way we really do it. Is, is anyone in the room a skier? Yeah? I'm in India, I suppose. <laughs> Are there any skiers here? I live close to a ski resort. Has anybody here learned to ski before? Yeah. How did you learn to ski? So you took a class, and uh, well, did they teach you that move called a snowplow? Yeah, that's what my kids are learned. They learned uh, pizza and French fries. And uh, the goal of the snowplow is to learn how to feel stable on slippery snow going downhill. You don't learn the snowplow to get really good at snowplow. There is no Olympic snowplow event, and and the best skiers do not snowplow through those moguls. They stop it. That template is a snowplow, and it's critically important to use to learn. But once you get it, once you realize that the point is having a, a good conversation, stop it. It's embarrassing all of us. Uh, it, it's, you can't snowplow and call yourself a professional. What you need are really strong conversations about who's using the product, and there's a lot of subtlety about that because there's often different kinds of people using the same product what they're trying to accomplish, and why they're trying to accomplish it. And not just why they're trying to accomplish it, but why we as a business want them to be using the software to accomplish it. But it's more complicated than that. There's a lot more to talk about than just who, what, and why. It's, it's not as simple as these two people talking to each other. It's not just a user and developer. We've got product managers and, and uh, business analysts and testers and user experience people and project managers, and they all want to have different conversations. They want to have conversations about, well, if I'm a product manager, what is the chunk that gives me some sort of return on investment or, or benefit in the market? And, and if I'm a BA, I, I need to understand technical details. What goes on under the scenes? That in, uh, what are the business rules that drive this thing? And, the, and if I'm a tester, I need to understand boundary conditions and how to break it and where it's likely to break. If I'm a UX person, I certainly don't want you telling me what the UI looks like. It's my job to design that. I need to know who's using it and what they're trying to accomplish it so that I can then do the UI. If I'm a project manager, all those details are interesting, but I need to know if there are dependencies, how long this is going to take, if it's started, 
uh, and, and where it is in progress. It's a lot of conversations. And it's a lot more conversations than, well, the original idea is I would just flip the card to the back and I would write acceptance criteria on it. But it's going to take a freaking huge card to hold all this information. Uh, is anybody old enough to remember when libraries used to have card catalogs in them? So uh, for those that are young, it's a weird device, uh, like a record player. Uh, but uh, you used to go into a library, there was a card catalog, I'd look at the, up the card and I'd pull out the card, it would say the name of the book and a little bit about it, but I knew that that card was not a book. The, the book is somewhere else on the shelf and it's got lots of chapters and a ton of information. Story cards and the tokens we use are like that. Uh, but your information is going to be in rally, it's going to, to, to be in um, confluence, it's uh, in some wiki, some document, some place, or collected as information on the wall uh, in the, the most informal situations. That's great. Now, that's one complication, but we got the size problem. A size always matters. Now, if I'm having a conversation that's, well, it's user-sized, if I'm a user expressing things as a need, that's fairly uh, straightforward. I know what a need size is, but then some developer says, hey, that's an epic. It's way too big. It, it has to be small enough to fit into a sprint. Well, that's uh, smaller than I need, actually. And uh, well, what's the ideal size for a story to, to go into a sprint or an iteration? Did I hear anything? Did I hear a couple? Third of a third of a sprint. I hear a third of a sprint. Uh, I, when I started with this stuff, it could be bigger, could be smaller. But you hear a couple days. But the point is, it's well, isn't associated with need size. It's associated with development time. And I hear a couple days to develop is ideal. And hey, if I'm a business leader, uh, well, that's not even interesting to me. What's interesting for me to talk about are features and stuff I put in milestones. And I'm certainly not interested in those little two-day things. And um, kind of a little bit more interested, well, interested in things that make a difference to me as a business. And well, there are different right sizes for stories and for conversations. Now, that's, that's another tough thing. Now, the truth is there's lots of right sizes and stories go through a journey. If you picture yourself looking down the neck of a funnel and in that funnel is the, the smallest, I'm going to think of that as the development cycle, and uh, out at the outer edge of the funnel, that's the release cycle. And my stories, have, I've got to pour them into this funnel and they've got to go down and turn into software. And well, my, the things I write down may start as big capabilities or features, uh, uh, big opportunities, and I've, and I've got to, way too, they won't even fit in the funnel. I've got to have a lot of conversation, and in those conversations, I need to break those stories down into smaller size, small enough that I can decide which ones go into a first release, which ones go into a second release. And in those conversations, I might add more details. And then once I've identified which ones go into a first release, I can pop those into the funnel and have more conversations and add more information. Now, if anyone's a business analyst or a, a product owner, you know that you go through lots of conversations, you add a lot more to your stories, you might bring them into a, a, a workshop or a, a grooming session, and you show the stories and all the acceptance criteria, and how many of you have heard, that story's too big? And, yeah, at least a couple. Uh, so it's those stories that you've got to break down into even smaller stories. And it's those smallest stories that, that are right-sized that shuttle through that, through that sprint iteration across the Kanban board. And it's those stories that are pile up as done or potentially shippable software. It's, it's those stories that, well, we're supposed to be actually showing these to end users, but end users really aren't so interested in your cool new checkbox. They're interested in things that support their work, user size things, so we kind of have to let a few of these pile up into chunks that I can validate with real people. And it's those chunks that I then kind of, that eventually pool up into big things that I can release. That's the journey that stories go through. And the mistake I see most people doing is trying to break them down to that tiny size to begin with. Is anybody aware of the old Atari game, Asteroids? Anybody know that? You played that game uh, 
Well, in that game, there's a, a little spaceship in the middle, and there's these big rocks kind of moving around. And your job is to shoot those big rocks, and they break down into smaller rocks. You shoot those smaller rocks, they break down into even smaller rocks, and then you shoot those. Now, the bad thing about asteroids is when you sh the big rocks are big, slow-moving rocks, but when you shoot them, they break down, down, down into smaller rocks that move faster. Shoot them again, they break down into even smaller rocks that move really fast. A bad asteroid strategy is to break down all your big rocks into small rocks right away because they will crush you and kill you. A bad backlog strategy is to break down your big stories or epics right away because they will crush you and kill you. Don't do that. In fact, one of the things you can do with stories is if you've got a lot of little ones, you can actually roll them back up into big ones. Can't do that with, in asteroids, unfortunately, but you can with stories. Keep your backlog low. Uh, that works a little bit better. And know that this is a natural, uh, progressive refinement thing that goes on inside your pipeline. Now, I promised to talk about the story mapping thing. I'm having too much fun and taking too long, but I've got to talk about one more problem. And uh, uh, multiple people talk to me about, it's just, it's, okay, great, I see this breakdown thing, but it, Developers tell me, and I know, it, I can't break them down any smaller. So I'll tell you what I told someone earlier is that it's a skill. It takes practice, and it's kind of hard. And trust me, if you keep doing it, it'll get better. But I, but I want you to think of cake. Now, if uh, this metaphor works for me, it might fall apart for you. But if, let's say, I had a, a wedding, and uh, Indian weddings are much bigger affairs than they are in the, in the U.S., but uh, is, a, is a big wedding cake ever served here? Yeah, sometimes uh, it's, the, it's a big affair in the, in the U.S., and they're, they're big things. And if I was going to make a big thing, a big wedding cake, I would, I, and I was going to bake that, I would normally break that down into a recipe, which is, for a big cake, lots of flour, lots of sugar, lots of eggs, lots of milk, and, and steps for beating things and baking things. Now, that's good, uh, but your job with stories, the trick to breaking them down is to break them down into little cakes, cupcakes. And those little cupcakes have a similar recipe, just less. A little sugar, a little flour, a little water, things like that. And, well, that's the skill that's hard, uh, breaking cakes down into cupcakes. And it's these, it's cakes that are stories, it's these things that we refer to as tasks or delivery tasks. So if you, gotta, you think of your developers as, uh, well, they're the bakers. They're the, they're, you, you put cakes in backlogs and those sprint backlogs or those tasks, those are filled with recipes and uh, cooking steps, things like that. Now, we've got a lot of challenges working with stories and I need to talk about this story map thing. Stories are built for discussions or for telling stories. And if we're trying to tell a story about a whole product, it's, and we don't know how big it is and we need to break it down, then that's what a story map is for. Start building a story map when you've got a, a problem that you need to better understand. We'll have a discussion that starts not just at exactly what to build, because remember, we got to talk about who, what, and why. We start with the big why. Why are we building this product feature thing? And we can set some goals about what success is. We can talk about who, talk about the users who use something. And then we say, OK, well, let's paint a picture the same way Kent said, and let's tell a story about what they do, step by step by step. First they do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And uh, we can tell that story step by step. And then we can break that story down into all the details. Well, if they're going to do that in the first step, well, what do we need the software to be able to do? Uh, what other things could they have done? What goes wrong? And we end up with this kind of big, fat map. And by map, I mean a simple two-dimensional structure. It's everything above uh, that that, well, it isn't. Well, there, you can think of them as the bigger stories or context or other things, but that's the big who, what, and why uh, for everything else. And, well, those bigger stories at the top get referred to as a backbone. They provide structure for the map. Now, that's what a map looks like. We've got a lot of people in the back of the room. Does anybody want to build one of these things? 
do you trust me that I can uh, walk you through building one in 15 minutes? This is going to be tough. There's a lot of people in the back, and we need some table space. So I'm going to grab a, I'm going to grab some just a few sticky notes. There's only sticky notes on the front here, so some people in the back need to move forward uh, onto the into the front, and you could uh, steal a few sticky notes uh, from these tables. And if you want to just hang back and watch what happens, that's that's okay too. But you should come forward and uh, join these people. Give this a shot. So all the tables should have them on, and we're going to do this really fast. Now I'm hoping people have pens because sticky notes without pens or there's pencils on the table really stinks. All right, the best way, story maps are for telling stories. I need everybody to uh, tell a story and I want to uh, teach you some concepts of what goes into a story map uh, as we go here. The best way to do this is to actually tell a story about something you've already done, something you've already experienced raise this just a little bit, see if that works. Uh, how many people woke up this morning? <laughs> At least half, that's good. Uh, I want you to think back to the moment that you woke up this morning, and we're gonna do a very quick silent brainstorming thing because we need to populate this story map with lots of things people do. So if you think to the minute you woke up this morning until well, if we just talk about the, the minute we woke up uh, until, I need a better pen, I'll get one during the break here, uh, until we l left, uh, left our home or hotel room, what I want you to do is write down everything you did between those two steps. So if I think back to, to me, the, the first thing I did was uh, hit snooze. Actually, I, I, I did that twice. Uh, and uh, from then on, I got up and I went to the toilet and it goes on from there. You're all gonna need probably 20 or so sticky notes and you need to write as fast as you possibly can. Go. <laughs> If you're in the back and not participating, you might grab a sheet of paper and just actually write a list. It might, it'll help you get the same concepts down. I will tell people that to finish this activity takes exactly the length of the time of the song Kung Fu Fighting. I don't have speakers, so you can't hear it, so it's for me. Verbs? Okay, verbs are important. It's difficult to tell stories about what people do without verbs. These particular short verb phrases that, are natu that we naturally speak in or talk about are what I'm going to call, or not what I call, what, what lots of other people call user tasks. Now tasks is a tricky word in agile development because we use that to say what developers do to make software, but these are what you do to get out to reach that goal of getting out of the door in the morning. Now, uh, do a quick scan, count. Did anybody get more than 10 written? Do anybody more than 15 written? Anybody? I give people, yeah, a few. 
So why would some people write more tasks than other people? And you got to shout loud. More detail. More uh, granular. Yeah, you guys know all the answers. Uh, uh, what else? More post-its. <laughs> you had more post-its. You didn't run out of post-its. Uh, you do multitasking. Well, well let me, I'm going to fill in for you to, to, to go fast here. I, I, lots of people talked, and yeah, that's, uh, I can't hear two things at once. That's bad. Uh, you had more time, actually, yeah. So if you have more time, if you get up earlier, you can do more. Now, uh, this may come as a shock to you, but people are different, and they do things differently. If anyone has children, I guarantee you have more tasks uh, than other people who don't. If you have pets, it might be similar. If you have more time, it might be similar. If you have a little bit of a dedication to a, a, an exercise or workout regimen, it might be similar. If you've got a, an annoying job, you probably have tasks for checking email and other things like that that others may not. Uh, but basically, there are differences uh, among people. Now, let's pick apart this more detail thing. Mr. Coburn for talking about the, the goal level of these tasks. Now, he talks about, uh, he uses a C level metaphor to talk about what's in the middle uh, as functional level, and he'll annotate those with ocean waves because that's at sea level. A functional level task is something I would do with a reasonable expectation that I would complete it before moving on to something else. Like, take a shower is one of those. Because you don't get halfway through taking a shower and say, man, this is dragging on, I'm going to go grab a cup of coffee and come back and finish this shower later. You finish it, but taking a shower decomposes down to adjusting water temperature and washing hair and washing body, and because people are different, my wife has these tasks with some loofah mitt thing, and I don't have those tasks, and, and I don't use cream rinse, I'll admit it, and, and uh, the things like that. We're different, and oftentimes the difference are in those subtasks, um, and Alistair will annotate those with a fish, and then above that it might be summary level tasks, and uh, Alistair will annotate those with a kite, but those functional level tasks are the ones that matter. For de designing software or thinking about users meeting their goals or actually getting a value or benefit, they've got to complete something that's functional. Once they complete something that's functional, if it's crap, then you can modify things underneath it to make it better. But if they can't complete something functional, then it, then it doesn't matter. All right, now uh, see how fast we can do these next couple steps here. Here's the... Uh, I need, all of you at a table have done this, and what we need to do is organize these into a, a model that shows what you did, and uh, basically if you organize these tasks into a flow from things you did early, early to things you did late, you'll end up with sort of a left to right flow. And uh, this would be easy if you were doing this all by yourself, but I want a map that shows how people get ready in the morning. In the same way, you want a map that talks about how people use your software, not just one person uses your software. So we've got to merge these together. This means you're all going to have to merge yours into one left to right flow. And this is going to be a problem because people did things in different orders. Some people did things that other people didn't do. And there will be arguments about what order to place things in. Fortunately, I have a simple remedy for that. And that's to shut up. No talking. Organize these things left to right. Uh, put them in a flow. You might find that some people have subtasks or similar things. You could stack them. And if you don't agree where, with where someone put it, you can move it. And if they disagree with you, they can move it back. But you'll find this goes easier than you think. So organize these on the tables left to right. Uh, if you're in the back, you might pop up and watch what these guys do. And go. Just have a, a minute or so. Get these things left to right as fast as you can. If you talk less, it'll go faster.
for now. I'm going to blow my time box really bad if I don't stop you. So I have to conclude this and show a few pictures. All right, all together, I want to tell you that the, the order things are left to right is what I'm going to call a narrative flow. That's the order I tell the story. And people will say, hey, Jeff, the world doesn't work that way. I have this process where I do step A, and then I come to this decision point, and I could do step C or step D. How do you show that in a story map, Mr. Smart Guy? And I say, well, I just do A, uh, uh, C, and, and, and D. Why did I do C and D? And they say, well, why do you do that? Uh, why do you put it in that order? And I say, I didn't put it in that order. You did. You told me I do A, and then I could do C or D. All that connective tissue between stories, like I could do A and then C or D, all those extra words come out of your mouth. They're not, this isn't UML. This does not replace UML. It doesn't replace use cases. It doesn't replace any other modeling mechanism. Arrange these in the order you would tell the story. And if there's ands and ors and other kinds of conjunctions, eh, let them come out of your mouth. And if you need to, draw a UML model. Now, that's what narrative flow is. And you'll find that if people did what you see top to bottom are, well, details and variations. Uh, alternative ways that other people that p other people do things see if we can get a couple more steps in this uh, and then I can conclude a little bit if you read across that map left to right you'll find that well it's fairly long but you'll find that there's some natural chunks or breaks in it you'll often find if you're doing talking about real work that people do in a house that oftentimes when you move from room to room there's a break so, like you might find all that stuff about uh, getting out of bed is here, and there's some stuff about uh, getting cleaned up and ready, and some stuff about making breakfast. Take another color of sticky notes, or you could use whatever color you've got. By the way, in a pad of sticky notes, not many people know this, you get two shapes. You get a square and a diamond. Free. Uh, wherever you see a, a group of things that look together, at the beginning of that group, put a sticky note, and and then put another sticky note. So uh, I could say all these things are about you know, getting myself out of bed and all these things are about uh, uh, you know, cleaning myself up. Mark it with sticky notes and this, I will tell you that it's, you need to write something on this, this is a, and you need to keep these verbs also. But really, you only got a minute. Mark them fast, decide fast. It's gonna be, uh, don't argue about it. Make sense? Go. You've got to shout out, read me the, the top, just the big things at the top. Taking care of health. Family time. Getting ready for conference. Just those three? Anybody else finish? Uh, can you read what you've got across the top? Wake up. What was the first one? Next one? Freshen up. Freshen up. Check. Check. Check work. Okay. News. 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 Back up. Back. Back up. Back up. Pack up. Okay. Eat and drink. Eat and drink. Leave. Leave. Okay. So there's kind of different levels of things there. They rolled up at a higher level. You rolled up at a lower level. Does that flow sound familiar or? Right enough. So what's interesting is if you stay in narrative flow, we can go up a level and there's still in narrative flow. Still tells a big story, so I don't have to read all those other little stories. The term I'll use for these, that's a user-centric term, is an activity. Activities are things that people do with lots of tasks that uh, they may do in oftentimes many order and uh, omit some and keep some. Now we could go to town on this story map and I could ask you to fill this in with tasks that you do on other days and, and I could ask, I could play what about with you, what about when things go wrong, or what about, uh, uh, well, uh, when you're, uh, my daughter didn't do her homework and I've got to hurry fast stop what I'm doing and help her do that or my wife is sick and I've got to take the kids to school and uh, uh, other sorts of things and I could fill these in, I could also say well what about 
uh, what if my morning could be better? What are the things I would do to make it really good? I would exercise. I'd make a better breakfast. I'd get up early. I'd read a little bit. And I could put all those things in and really fatten this map up. And we want to do that because we want to think of everything we could do. We're not. We're going to do one quick last step, and that's to plan. I want you to, maybe most people might have a first task in there of turning off their alarm or something like that. Pretend that task didn't happen because your alarm did not go off. You woke up and your eyes sprung open and it was 8.57 and you wanted to be here at this conference on time and you know you're going to be late. You need to get out of the house as fast as you possibly can. I want you to look at all those tasks and I want you to move everything, just keep things at the top that you would do and move everything down that you would not do if you had to get out of the house in just a few minutes. Now you have to satisfy everyone at the table I see men often skipping the shower stage and saying I could just apply extra deodorant and women not being okay with that. Uh, you might have to write more tasks for things that you would do in that situation. Uh, just take a minute, just quickly shovel things down and see what you have left in that top slice. That conversation about all the details and all the acceptance criteria. If we're thinking about value and benefit, we've got to have stories that whole product or whole feature we've got to tell stories at whole product and whole feature levels. And my first goal is to understand that thing, understand who, what, and why, not for this little tiny thing, but for the, the thing that has value. Then I, once I understand it, I get the whole flow, I want to then explore details and options and all those whatabouts. And then I want to plan. I want to say, gosh, to be feasible for us to deliver this on time, I need to focus on a specific uh, user, a set of users, and some specific context, and let's slice this up into what are useful releases. And then I need to carry those things into uh, this, this routine sprinting cycle of having more detailed conversations. Then I want to write all that acceptance criteria and really dive into details, but that's when I'm delivering. Story mapping is for breaking down big ideas and big features and helping me figure out what the, the minimal viable release is for those features, helping me have big conversations. Now, the, the, that first understanding starts with framing the product with what's that product, who is it for, and why. And uh, I'll often build simple, lightweight personas to describe those. I'll often name product goals and even go so far as to, to name metrics for those. The next thing is to imagine that product's use and tell a big story left to right. Uh, these are guys that uh, they're, they're starting with understanding who the users are. And they're, let me show a little bit of this, they're telling a story. And I want to watch just enough of this to see these guys work. They start by writing cards that give us that narrative flow, that big left to right green stripe is the first people do this, and then this, and then this. And the, the thing is, we love to work top down, but sometimes our head doesn't naturally think in activities, so they add the activities in later to, to make it easier to read and to sort of summarize things that kind of all go together. And then they start moving forward to talking about details and fattening this thing up, adding lots of what abouts and we could do this and it would be better if we did this. They're making a next version of existing product and they're looking at this product they don't like very much now and they're writing uh, stories about it and you can see this thing is getting fatter and fatter. People will ask me what is the difference between those bright green cards and the other light green cards in the, in the middle of that thing. There's no difference. Uh, they just ran out of one kind of card. But it's a signal that they've been telling the story over and over and rewriting it and ripping it up. These are just cards. They're just rip them up and make sure the story still tells right. That's the important thing. Those, those short titles and these nice titles uh, work like that. Now, that's one way to do it, but I work with other people that say, gosh, it works better for me to think about the user interface first and sketch UI and a storyboard, and then I can lay that out and then break things down underneath that. And well, it's once I've got that that I can do this exploration phase, this breaking things down and think about other you. Uh, this is where I pull a lot of other people into this map to help me do this. Now, uh, these people are having a, this is a real story conversation. 
that guy uh, talking is the finance manager of a bank. He's interested and engaged because this is a story about his life. He can engage with this thing because it isn't a stupid story about a checkbox. It is uh, something that's important and the, the guy writing a sticky note is actually not writing a story so much. He's writing down a problem that he has that they want to figure out what to do about with, with a story. Now, advance ahead, it's, it's these that's that same map and that you, by now they've fattened it up. You can see that it's fairly big and there's a lot of things we can do with that map. But here's where the real power of this kind of structure comes in. This is the same group at a company called Globo. And well, this is a map. When I first encountered this group of people, I'm running a couple minutes over. Who, uh, the person with the next presentation, where'd he go? Is he in here? Yeah, there you are. It's, it, well, but uh, yeah, you might want to come up here and say, damn it, get out of here. <laughs> but, uh, we'll see if I can wrap up here. But this is the punchline for, for me. Uh, when I came into the room, there were three teams working together on a revision of this big content management system. And they were, all had their respective backlogs on paper, and they were arguing. And uh, I said, guys, you've got three different teams, and it's a big project, and you've divided up this work, and you can't figure out how to start and proceed, but this is one product. So to get value, you each have to deliver something, and you can't see it if you, you can't imagine it and plan this, so get it on the wall. And they did, and they were happy. And I came back a couple days later, and they were sad. And uh, I said, well, what's wrong? And they said, we can't possibly deliver all of this on time. And I, I said, well, how long is it going to take you to do this? And they said, oh, a year or more, which is how developers say two years. And, and I said, oh, gosh, I know your CEO, and he won't tolerate anything that takes longer than a few months. And they said, yeah, he, we need this to go live for Brazilian elections, uh, and that's in four months. And I said, you know, you can't get all this stuff done. If we say, what do we need to go live successfully for Brazilian elections, what would that be? And they thought, well, what does it mean to go live successfully for Brazilian elections? Well, we probably just need to do the news website and maybe a couple of these political blogs. And we just need things that give us these animated, real-time charting stuff. And uh, let's focus on that. So they add tape lines in here. And they go to work moving stories up and down. And they slice this map up into what are successful releases, where the Everything above that line is what they need to go live for Brazilian elections, all those yellow stories. And what's written on that orange thing out there, that's that goal. That's what success means for this release, which is going live for Brazilian elections and getting the, the outcomes they want for that. Now, everything else lays it out there in a roadmap of other releases. We've not talked about all those details with story maps, with stories. We've not figured out acceptance criteria. We've just talked enough to start to imagine this product and start to make a first sensible break of things. I'm going to do one last thing, and we're going to wrap this up. Um, well, I always have to do this demonstration because it's, it's meaningful. And maybe I can do this. Maybe not. Yeah, start, uh, start uh, getting set up here. Uh, if, if I were to, I, this may be a big feature, a, a big new product, and if I release this, I get all this business benefit. But when I look at it, it's going to take me too long to release. So my first layer of planning is to sort of break it down into smaller chunks that each have some value or benefit. And uh, it's those chunks, well, that I use to make change for that big story, and those may be a series of incremental releases. Now, but those are still too big to fit in a single sprint. Um, so let's focus on this first release, because I can build that first, and I know that it has value. But I need small things that I can deliver in every single sprint. And each, it's each one of these that I build that adds to this product and builds this up. Now, a stupid thing to say is, can you prioritize these by business value? What is the value of this versus that? Uh, if you ask a business stakeholder, which one do you need first? They're going to say, fuck, I don't know. I need them all. 
the way you prioritize these is by building the thing that you can learn from first, that you can validate assumptions first and learn fastest from first. Those are the ones that you have all those detailed story conversations on. And uh, I wanted you to see this transition, this flow from big stories to little stories. And well, how we prioritize for value at, at release time versus how we prioritize for value, well, uh, later. I'll leave you with this, that uh, first off, stories are, these stories are for telling stories. You've got to be able to imagine users using things. If you can't imagine it, you can't build it. And a story map is about, well, seeing the whole structure, the big thing. And it's about seeing the whole tree and seeing the whole product and not about piling things up in a leaf bag and, and tossing them away at people. That's that. Thanks for staying longer for the people that could and let's get to the next thing.